some scriptures from the, the Bible, uh, 2 Kings chapter number 5, and I'd like to just uh, read a story that probably every kid read in Sunday school or, uh, or most people would know about. <clears throat> it has to do with uh, Naaman and uh, his condition of leprosy and uh, how God heals him, if you know the a whole story there. I won't be able to read it all for sake of time, but I'll read some verses that pertain to uh, where we'll draw our thoughts from. Uh, as far as I know, this will be my last time uh, in the pulpit here uh, for a while. So I'd like to just say thank you uh, to the church for taking care of us. Uh, for, you know, when I get invited to to uh, come to America to do a meeting. I don't come unless I'm invited and I don't come to everywhere I'm invited. I, I pray and I have to sort of feel that I'm meant to go. Um, but truthfully, if I get invited to come here because your pastor is such a good friend and has been such a blessing and I, and I do hope you realize um, the kind of pastor that you have. Uh, let, let me just tell you, every pastor I know is a little bit quirky, okay? <laughs> Just, I just tell you. So they, they, they all have their, you know, their, their, just their funny little ways they do things. And that's just, this is the nature. And you get to see it because they're up front so much. Probably we all have it. Uh, but your pastor is someone who is very, very sincere in his faith. Uh, there, there are not two Jason Murphys. If you, if you know him privately... <laughs> Oh, I'd take another. If you, uh, if you know him privately, you know, he talks, he, he's very sincere about his faith. He wants to see people come to Christ. He really cares about what God cares about. He wants to do the right thing. Uh, he, he labors over his preparation of sermons. He prays. He doesn't treat it lightly. Uh, he feels uh, to lead a local church is a sober responsibility. He's always thinking and praying how he can do better. Uh, if he makes a mistake, it smites his heart and he wants to get it right. And I'm just saying it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. That's, that's a good pastor. That's, that's, that's a good pastor who preaches the word of God. And uh, your pastor is held in esteem uh, by uh, uh, you know, many well-known men of God. And that's why they come here. Uh, because they, 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 they respect him and they love this church. And so I just say I appreciate that. Uh, it's harder and harder in our day to get uh, a good man of God to be the pastor of the local church. Uh, what, what, you know, they're just not everywhere. You might think, well, I know lots of pastors. Yeah, but, I'm, but honestly, a good one, balanced, caring, loving, who will listen to what God is telling him, they're just not easy to get. And uh, you have a good situation here. God is blessing the church here. Uh, God is uh, working uh, through you. God is using this church to support many missionaries in many places. Uh, people are getting saved in this area. I heard about someone yesterday who, who a pastor was able to uh, lead to Christ. And it was, it was a wonderful story. It touched my heart. And so God is using this local church and I hope you'll be faithful right up to the sound of the trumpet that, you know, you'll just be caught in your place uh, when that happens and you'll keep going. And uh, we, we, uh, we appreciate you. you. You influence and you do more than you may know you do. And so thank you to this church. And of course, the church has a history. There was a pastor here before this one and he too was faithful and preached and served God over many years. So, so thank you for taking care of Joe and I. We always feel quite welcome here. Uh, Joe and I have come off a fairly uh, difficult time, truth be known, from the field. Uh, we've had a bit of a rough go over the last few months. And, uh, you know, uh, we're okay, but a little, a little shaken, numerous things have happened. And that's the nature of serving God. Uh, we do have an enemy. Who, uh, who wants to stop us, um, but uh, we, uh, we, we, we're okay here. We feel you've warmly received us and we've received a blessing. And when I'm not preaching, 
Uh, I'm never sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not preaching. I, I'm sitting there thinking, God, what is it you want to say to me? And I always pray for whoever's preaching, uh, whoever it is. I say, God, would you just, would you just rest on them? Would you, just, would you lead their mind, their thoughts, and help them to be a blessing? Because I, I need to listen, and I need to get whatever it is that uh, you have for me. So anyway, that's just a, a sincere thanks uh, for your support, for your care, and uh, we appreciate that we're able to be here. Second Kings chapter number five, let's read a few verses about Naaman uh, the Syrian, and um, we won't read the whole story, but uh, perhaps you already know the end. Verse number one, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honourable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said to, uh, king of Syria said, Go, to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, uh, 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, uh, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, uh, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, we won't read any more than that, but if you did read on, and if you know already, uh, you would know that Naaman, in fact, does get cured of his leprosy by following the steps uh, that the man of God gave to him. Uh, but for purposes of uh, our message this morning, I, I want to uh, just look at uh, Naaman here uh, he had a condition that he could not fix himself. Uh, leprosy just seemed to be beyond anybody's ability to do anything about. And uh, even though this man is successful, uh, he's uh, been a great military leader. Uh, he has connections all the way through with the royal family. Uh, so Thailand has a royal family and much of the structure of the country is tied to those who are connected with the royal family. And it goes down in sort of waves of, you know, levels. And those people, you would say, would be uh, the most influential in the country, probably the most wealthy. And, uh, you know, to be connected is a big thing in a country like this, to have those connections. But you could have, he had all of that, but still he has his leprosy, and, uh, and he, can't, he can't cure himself. Now, uh, Naaman uh, is going to intersect in his life three people who have the knowledge of God. So there are, there are three people here that, that Naaman will come across and each of these three, they know about God. Now Naaman doesn't, he's a Syrian. And he doesn't, he doesn't know about these things. But there are three people here who possess the knowledge of God. And uh, we're going to just briefly look at their responses to somebody who had a great need and what they did or did not do with their knowledge of God. 
and we will think about ourselves and we might say, am I like this one? Uh, or am I like this one? Or am I like this one? Or maybe we might be a little bit combined of, of each of these three. So three people who have the knowledge of God, uh, a man who has a condition that only God can help him with. Uh, uh, he, he needs God. He needs what God can do. Uh, I, uh, I believe that there is uh, nobody uh, who will come to the Lord who cannot be helped by the Lord. Uh, Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I don't believe there's anybody no matter whatever their problems are, uh, no matter whatever their lifestyle may be, uh, no matter whatever their choices perhaps have been, no matter the nature of their upbringing and how those things perhaps have shaped them, I don't believe there's anybody, if they came to Jesus, that he would look at them and say, you know what, I'm really sorry, I think, I think your, your situation's a bit too difficult. I, I don't know I could help you. I don't believe that. Uh, I believe that you point everybody to Christ and even when somebody has a problem and you don't know what to do, you point them to Jesus and then when they meet Jesus, he tells them what to do after that. Sometimes people say to me, uh, well, if those people get saved, uh, what are you going to tell them? And I say, I'm not going to tell them anything. Jesus will tell them and he'll work it out. And in our church, we have those people and lots of different people who've come to Christ. And, and truly, when they came, they, they had a, a world of complex problems and issues. And you say, what did you do? I told them about Jesus. I told them that, that he loved them. He died for their sins, that he was the way of salvation, uh, that he's the only true God. And I invited him to come. And really, all I did is I said, uh, so-and-so, this is Jesus, and uh, Jesus, this is so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, they sort of shook hands, and I just stepped back out of the way after that point, and then they worked it out. They worked it out. And don't ever think somebody's beyond help. Don't, don't ever look at somebody and say, well, they couldn't be saved. Don't, don't, don't ever do that. And so uh, Naaman has a condition, looks pretty bad, looks pretty bad, uh, no, 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 uh, no, no human help seems to be able to undo this one. It's pretty complex. Uh, most people who have this condition didn't get help. But he's going to intersect three people here who have the knowledge of God. And the first one that he comes across is this one who we don't know her name, but she's just called in verse 2, uh, a little maid. And, uh, and what we know about her She's probably young. You know, in Thailand, it's common for people to have uh, uh, maids in the home that come from Burma. And so the, the Burmese uh, look for work in Thailand, and many of them will come to a Thai home of considerable wealth. And uh, they're not, well, I should say they're not held captive. Most times they're not held captive, but sometimes they are. And they will come to a house and their status is very low. Uh, they're, uh, they're uh, you know, I don't want to say the Thais look down on the Burmese, but they're just considered, you know, they do all uh, the jobs down here. They certainly don't have any power or influence in Thailand. And, uh, and uh, so it's quite common. And uh, this, this young girl uh, was, not in, was not in Syria by choice. Uh, it, it tells us how she got there. And how she got there was that a raiding band of Syrians came to her village or her town, maybe it happened at night, and they snatched her away from her family. Now, how do you think she felt about that? They took her by force uh, away from her family. Imagine if they took your daughter and there was nothing you could do. And they took her away and they took her to another country, to another people, where she didn't want to be, and she wasn't looking to go, and she lost everything in her world, 
uh, her parents weren't available anymore and her brothers and her sisters and where she grew up was all taken from her and uh, she was probably sold, uh, auctioned off in a market and, uh, and uh, somebody bought her to uh, work in the house and it turned out the person that she was working for was Naaman's wife. And so here she is, she's a little maid uh, brought there against her will uh, under, you know, bad circumstances and she finds herself in the house uh, of Naaman and his wife and she knows that Naaman has leprosy and the thing about this little girl is she has the knowledge of God. So, so she knows who the true God is and she knows what's really true. And uh, now she's in the house here and, uh, and Naaman has leprosy and uh, she speaks up. She speaks up for God in verse number three. She says unto her mistress, you know, uh, would God, uh, you know, Naaman, my Lord, she called him, will wish the prophet in Samaria because that would get him a cure for his leprosy for sure. Uh, God, God, had, God had used the man of God, I'm, I'm sure. And I commend her for the fact that she spoke up for the Lord under those circumstances. Now, now, I never thought this would happen to me. And I hesitated to share this with you because you might have a meeting after this and drop my support or something. I'm not sure. But I, 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 I hesitated to share this because it's pretty bad. And I feel, I feel a bit bad about sharing it. But in the interests of transparency and truth, and that it sort of ties in with the message, I, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just share it. Uh, I never thought this would happen to me. This has never happened to me before. Uh, this only happened to me in the last year. So in all my years of being saved, uh, I've always been uh, a person who wanted to tell anyone I could uh, about, about how to get saved. Nobody, nobody had to enrol me in a soul winner's class. I'm just so glad to be saved. I couldn't stop talking about it. And, uh, and I would just give out tracts and I'd do all sorts of things. And I'd do it as a teenager, which I didn't realise, but it sort of gave me a certain, you know, it just wasn't common in Australia. And, uh, I, I, and I was just sort of crazy bold, you know, crazy bold. And uh, I remember there was a, a we just near our home, government housing area, sort of gang area. There was a, a gang of guys on bikes and in the days when they wore chains and did a lot of bad stuff. And, and there was a, a group, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe 30 of them all, all sort of parked there late at night. And I was riding my bike home. I was probably about uh, 15. I was riding my bicycle home. I shouldn't have been out that late at night. I'd been to see a friend and I saw them all over there. And I felt a voice say to me, go and witness to them. And, uh, and, and because I was just sort of crazy bold, I thought, yes, I can do it. And so I started pedaling my, my, my push bike over to them and they were drinking and they were all standing there and they looked really mean. And, and I just pedaled my bike over there and uh, they were looking at me coming and, uh, and I, just got, I just stopped my bike right in the middle and I said, Every one of you needs to get saved. You die in your sins, you're going to go to hell, and only Jesus can save you. And that's why I come over here to tell you. And about that moment, I realized where I was. <laughs> and, and, and they were looking at me, and, and I became fearful. And, um, and a couple of particularly mean-looking people stepped forward, and, uh, and they came up to me, one grabbed my bike, and the other reached up to grab me, and it was, it was, it was looking like it was gonna get very ugly, and uh, somebody, I guess, who was the leader of that group said, leave him alone. And they looked at him, cussed a little bit, stepped back, said, leave him alone. And I looked, and I said a little bit more, <laughs> and uh, then I started to pull my bike back, and, and I rode off uh, home. Now, very strangely, I wasn't going to tell all this, but very strangely, uh, that person who said that, I later found out who that was, 
because they went to jail and they were in the paper. But that person actually got saved uh, a, a bit after that and is still, as far as I know, uh, living for the Lord. So, so that was a bit, I mean, but nobody had to tell me, and I've always been that way. I just, I just want to tell people and I'd give out tracks and I'd think up inventive ways to give out tracks. You know, I was that guy and, uh, and I'd have chick tracks and I'd get them out and all of that stuff. And, and, uh, and so I've always been a person that just wanted to do that. I was just so glad to be saved and I just think everybody ought to have this and, and I just want to tell people. Uh, but just last year, here I was in Thailand and, uh, you know, there's just some people doing some bad stuff to me. And it was kind of doing, they just, 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 I felt they were just doing some things to me that were really troubling me. And in troubling me, they were troubling the people around me. And it was, they were troubling my wife. And it was just, it was, it was just ongoing. And I, and I try, I tried to ignore it. And I just, and it just kept going on and on and on. And, and it started to get at me on the inside. And I got angry. And I finally decided, and I've never done this before, I thought, you know what? I'm so sick of these people, those particular people, I'm not even going to tell them how to get saved if they ask me. I mean, if they come and fall down at my feet and say, what must I do to be saved? I'm going to say, uh, well, just try to keep all the commandments and uh, do good things and you should be okay. <laughs> That's what I felt. And, and, uh, and I just, I just, I'm not even going to tell them. And I told Joe, I said, Joe, I'm not even going to tell them. And I don't care. And if they come and beg me to know how to get to heaven, I'll just say, uh, well, you know, just try to do good and your good will outweigh your bad and you'll probably be okay. That's probably what I'll do. Now, none of that is true, by the way. If, you, if, you, if you're here today, I'll just tell you, that's not true. And, uh, and, uh, and this is not unprecedented. There's a prophet here, Micaiah, who, uh, who got called up to prophesy and, uh, and uh, Ahab said, should we go to war or not? And he said, yep, just go, it'll be great. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but hey, I have news, he said, I t don't lie to me. And, uh, and that's kind of what I felt. And what can happen is when you've had a rough go of it by other people, there can be a temptation to get embittered and, and to, not, to hold back your witness. And I've got to commend this young girl who was snatched away from her home and, and was away and was not there by choice. But the great thing is she didn't, she didn't get bitter. Now, now uh, Elisha's servant Gehazi does because he says, he, he uses this word in verse 20, we didn't read it, but he says, Naaman this Syrian. He's like, why are we naming this Syrian? Yep. But she's right there and she doesn't do that. She speaks up. She speaks up for God. And uh, she, she, she tells what she knows. And the Lord doesn't ask any more of you than that. That you will just, you will just speak what you know. And you will, you will speak up for the Lord. One of the tactics of our enemy is to so overwhelm us with personal sorrows that it silences our witness. Yep. You, know, you know when you're feeling dejected and you're feeling down about your own life and it just can silence your witness. Yep. You feel like, I just don't even want to talk to anybody. And I just want to commend this girl for speaking up for God despite her own troubling personal circumstances. I'm going to say thank God for her that she, she, was, she was not overcome by all that happened, but she spoke up for the Lord. We had a lady saved about two years ago. I'd known this couple, and I don't know if I've told you this story here before, but I've known this couple for about eight years. So I met them in Bangkok and, and, I, and I'd watched them. I tried to witness to them a little bit, but it, they just... It was just hard to get there. They were very zealously involved in the religion uh, that most Thais follow. And they had family who were, you know, senior people in this religious group. And I tried to witness them, but really not without, you know, very limited. Nonetheless, I hung on. And I just stayed a friend. 
I, I kept his picture in my office and I tried to pray for him. And I just kind of hung on and hung on. And we had little bits of communication off and on. It had been about eight years. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, I was going to do a meeting. I'd been asked to preach a meeting down by the seaside at Padia. And uh, Pastor Lloyd was going to be there. He and I were preaching. And it was, it, the idea was this was a gathering of believers to just be strengthened in their faith. This wasn't outreach. This was just believers. We're going to have two or three days at this resort that... It was Miss Horn's group that they managed to get at a discounted price. And I was going to be there and preach. And Pastor Lloyd from Australia, my pastor, was going to be there. And so when I knew we were going there, I thought, oh, you know, they, they live nearby there. So I called on the phone. I said, look, I'm going to be in the area. Would you like to come and see me? Because it had been a while. And they said, sure, yeah, we, we, him and her, we'd, we'd, like to, we'd like to come and see you. And uh, so they came. Uh, she was in shorts and he was in shorts and, and uh, you know, they're kind of at the beach. And, and so we chatted and I was glad to see them. And, and then I said, uh, I said, look, uh, it's, uh, the evening had come around. I said, look, it's uh, evening now and I've got to go and speak at this meeting. They're all going to have dinner and then I've got to speak. Uh, I said, but why don't you come with me and sit down with me and eat and we can be there together? And they said, oh... Uh, well, we don't feel, oh, sure, it's fine, just come, sit with me. So uh, they said, okay. So, so we walked, we went to the hotel banqueting room, uh, and it was all set up, all the tables had white cloths, and there was one table, a large round table, it was, it was the VIP table. Now, I didn't do this, the group, in, there was the VIP table, and, there's a, and there it says Pastor Shemesh. And so there's myself and my wife, Suzanne, and Pastor Lloyd and his wife, and we walked in, and I said to, uh, I said to them, Pepsi and Boo, I said, uh, well, just come and sit at my table. Now, now you can imagine, everybody's... And they came in, they, they, I, said, I said, relax, relax, it's fine, just eat, relax, it's nice, it's all, all good. And uh, they ate at our table. And uh, I said, well, I've got to get up and preach now. And, and I got up and preached, and they sat and listened, and... Then Pastor Lloyd got up and preached and I got to the end of the message and Pastor Lloyd gave an invitation. He thought everybody there was saved. He gave an invitation for Christian workers who wanted to be more dedicated in their service for the Lord, would like prayer to uh, come forward. And uh, as he gave the invitation, uh, she was sitting in the front and uh, he said, uh, who is God is speaking to people. And people begin to raise their hands and... Uh, and uh, she was there, and it's the unsaved. And she was there, and she lifted up her hand, she started to cry. And she went. <laughs> and Pastor Lloyd was standing beside me, and I was looking. And uh, he said, uh, can you see that woman in the front row? And I said, mm-hmm. He said, what do we do about that? And I said, I don't know. And uh, so uh, the invitation was given. People were coming forward for Christian service. And she began to cry louder. And she's going... <laughs> like this. And finally, she just came forward. And her and her husband came forward. And they, they were on the floor. And they were crying. And she had her hands cupped. And she was weeping. And they came forward for salvation. Huh. Now, I've got to tell you, uh, her story. She was, she, was, she was born in a, it's not even a village, sort of a hut situation in the jungles of the border between Cambodia and Thailand. So she lived in the jungles far, far away from any, any even a village. And she lived with her grandparents and she told me, she said, from a little girl, my grandmother instructed me how to live in the jungle. And uh, she said we had tigers there and there was elephants and it was dangerous. And my grandmother would always tell me, look at the dogs. The dogs, if the dogs stop, they had lots of dogs. If the dogs stop, you stop too. And she said at night we'd go into, we'd lay down to sleep and my grandmother would make us all be quiet. Otherwise the tigers would hear us. And, and she grew up in that sort of environment and uh, no education, no schooling. And then finally the military, the Thai military came and they said, you can't stay here anymore. This is a dangerous area. There's a little bit of conflict going on. You must locate to the nearest village. 
So they trekked out of the jungle, they placed him in a village, she hardly went to school. Uh, she, she got a job, uh, she married Pepsi, and then she got tricked into going to an Arab country and she got sold into people's slavery. And so she went to this country, they took her passport away, uh, they tricked her, I won't tell you all the things that happened to her. Um, they would make her call home. She said she'd have to, they would give her a phone and she said, I had to call my family. And she said, a man would stand over me like this. And she said, I had to tell my parents, everything's okay, it's going really good here. And she said, if we didn't do that, they would, they would attack us. And she, she, she said, I thought I was trapped. Anyway, she, she managed to get over that. She had a lot of mental issues. She was on all kinds of medication. She was demonized. She used to do crazy things. I've seen videos of it. Her family who are unsaved says she's demon possessed. They took her to the temple and said, our daughter's got spirits in her. We don't know what to do. And all the monks chanted over her to get the spirits out. Do you understand that didn't work? <laughs> do you understand that just topped her up? And so it got worse and worse and worse. And she just looked like somebody beyond help. They took her only child away from her because they said she's unstable and she can't care for her. That, that was their life. So the day she came forth, she got saved. And she said to her husband, we have to move to Nakonsawan because that's where the church is. It was hours away. He said, we can't go, we'll starve. She said, I don't care, we starve, we, we have to go. They relocated, they came to Nakon Sawan, and God has done a miracle in their life. Uh, she was on all these medications for her mind. The doctors just kept prescribing new ones. Now, by the grace of God, it's been a year and a half, two years, she's off all medication. About four months ago, they approached her, they said, you know what, you've changed so much, I think it's time for your son to come home. <laughs> that little boy came back to that, he's in church, he was there yesterday, he's in church every service. And now they sit there, husband, wife and that little boy, and they have a Christian home. Now she's, 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 She's had a really rough go of it. There's, there's a lot more stories I could tell you. But here's what I want to just put the emphasis on. Every single day, she tells people about Jesus. She just can't stop. And every time, every time I get up and preach, it doesn't matter what I'm preaching on. Every time I get up and preach, I look down and she's, <laughs> she, just, she just loves him so much. And she just wants to tell everybody about Jesus. You know what she did? She overcame the sorrows of her life to still be a testimony for Christ. And one of the things that, that can silence us is our own heartaches. Our enemy wants us to become so consumed with the difficulties of our own life that we stop telling people about eternal life. And we've got to be careful for that. And so this was the first person who spoke up for God. And then the second one here I want you to see, and I'll move quick, we'll finish, is the faithless king. And so the, the little girl says, you know, if you would go there, I'm sure that the prophet there would be able to help you. And so the king of Syria writes letters and they get delivered to the king of Israel. Now, now verse number seven, the king of Israel also has the knowledge of God. He knows about the true God. He's got the prophet in his midst. He knows of all about that. And when someone comes to him with a really supersized problem and uh, at leprosy, you know what he says? He doesn't say, well, yes, God can help you. He doesn't say, well, you know, it's a big problem, but, but we got a big God, praise God. He doesn't say that. You know what he says? He says, uh, what? Am I God to cure a man of a leprosy? What are they thinking? I mean, what's going on here? Am I God? Am I God? No, no, you're not God. But you're supposed to speak for God. No one's asking you to be God. 
No one's saying that you can do it all on your own. No one's saying you have the answer to complex, difficult things. But can you speak for God? And he says, am I God? And then you know the second thing he does? He says, you know what this is about? This is just about picking a fight with me. That's what this is about. You know what that is? That's just self-absorbed. That's somebody who looks at everything through themselves. That's someone who looks at everything else in this way. How does it affect me? What is, what, what, what's, in, what's in this for me or what's this going to do for me? And there are some Christian people like that. But it ought not to be that we are selfish or self-absorbed. You know, you'll, you'll meet some things and you might say, am I God? Can I fix this? Listen, I'm surrounded by things in Thailand that deeply distress me. I see things all the time. And in a way, it's kind of harder for me than the Thais because the Thais are used to it. And they've learned sort of to cope with all what they see. But I see things, it's just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking. And I, and I think, God. And it, it really overwhelms me. But, but you know, I'm not, I'm not God, but here's what I can do. I can speak for God. I, I, I can say, I can't fix this, but I know somebody who could. Yep. Uh, I don't really know what to do, but I know someone who always knows what to do. That, that's what I can do. I can, I can point people to Christ. Honestly, if you knew that woman, Boo, she was, she was demonized. She was, she was just like crazy. They told me, her husband told me, she was stronger than three men. She could throw three men around a room. And, uh, and I've seen some videos. And she was just, you would look at that and say, I just don't know where you begin to help someone like that. But you know what? When she met Christ, Jesus just started to put everything in order. Just started to put everything in order. And now, now every Friday night prayer meeting, her and her husband and, and the boy are there. And his life has completely changed because God changed the life of his mother and father. God restored what looked like it was forever broken. God fixed things that, that doctors said, oh, you know, we don't know what to do with this. And, and am I God? Am, no, no, you're not God. But can you just speak for God? And that was the king. He just, he just, you know, what can I do? And then the last one here is Elisha, the man of God. And Elisha, when he hears the way the king has responded to that, Elisha says, you know what? Why don't you just send him to me and we'll get this worked out. Elisha, Elisha cared about people that ordinarily you probably wouldn't care about. Uh, the Syrians had been in many ways a troublesome curse to Israel, carrying off their people and other such things. But Elisha had an ability, and here's what I think, I think Elisha could discern that God was in this. I think Elisha could work out, you know, this is so unusual, this is God doing this. And we, just, we, we do have to have that kind of discernment where you just, you just can, can see. If I told you how all our people got saved, it's truly odd. It's, it's, I wouldn't write a book on it because there's no pattern. I wouldn't say you try and do this at home. But just the strangest things happened... Of, of just how our people got to us, how our people got saved. Very unusual things. But that's what happens when you get around where God is. You do start seeing things happen that are kind of, you know, it starts to feel a little bit like the book of Acts. And Elisha said, you know what, send him to me and, uh, and I'll help him. He had pity on his enemies. Elisha did not seek anything for himself. He just sought to be the man of God. And that's what we need to try to do. Just, 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 if you don't have faith in yourself, that's okay. But have faith in God. Amen. If you don't know what to do, it's okay. Many times I don't know what to do. But you do know who does know what to do. And sometimes all the Lord is asking you to do is just speak for him and just point people to just point people to Jesus and he'll work it out. And we've got incredible stories in our church of people who come from 
very diverse, different situations. And truly, I, I didn't know how it was going to get worked out. But when they got, all I did was just speak up for the Lord. And then when they got saved, the Lord just put it all in place. And, he, and, and I want to tell you, as much as it happened here, it's still happening today. It can still happen. It can happen around you. It can happen in Thailand. It can happen in Linwood. We just need to speak up for the Lord.